summit. Um, thank you. From the Andrew Gibbon Foundation. Um, today marks our second day. Yesterday was an incredible start filled with inspiring stories and so many wonderful celebrations that set the tone for our work ahead today. Today, we will continue our journey with a renewed focus on practical strategies and actionable insights. Our goal is to equip each of you with the tools and the knowledge necessary to drive meaningful change on your campuses and in your communities. The sessions and workshops planned for today are designed to deepen your understanding, enhance your skills, and to empower you to be effective civic leaders. Each of you plays a crucial role in this mission, and together we have the power to create lasting impact. Thank you all again for being here and for your dedication and enthusiasm. Let's make the most of today and learn from one another. Speaking of impact, today also happens to be Poll Worker Recruitment Day. The November election is just three months away, so we encourage each of you to consider signing up to be a poll worker using the link in the chat. We'll start today by quickly recapping the events of last night. So last night we began our summit with announcing our new high school program, which is the Living the Legacy Scholarship. Um, we will drop the link in the chat to learn more about that information. And then we honored our founding 15 campuses who have been with us since the very beginning. And this year we are celebrating 10 years of our Vote Everywhere program. Next, we honored six hidden heroes. Um, which you'll see all their pictures included on the screen, and then inducted our Alumni Hall of Fame for this year. Okay, I believe the next thing is a wonderful video, which will set the theme and the tone for today. Take it away, Mo. Oh, I was wrong. Today is, this is the schedule. So as you'll see, we're doing the intro right now. We'll transition into the keynote address and then start with Legacy Hour, which has two really exciting breakouts that fit the theme. The next hour focuses on champion, ambassador, and high school breakouts. We also have a session there if you don't fit into one of those categories. Our third one is all about activation hour. And our final one, you'll hear from three of our different campuses and our network on some of the work that they're doing, and we will close the day. Now it's time for the video. In the summer of 1964, a powerful movement took root in the heart of Mississippi, one that would alter the course of American history. This was Freedom Summer. We hope to, to send into Mississippi this summer upwards of 1,000 teachers, ministers, lawyers, and students from all around the country who will engage in what we're calling freedom schools, community center programs, voter registration activity, research work, work in the white communities, and in general, uh, uh, a program designed to open up Mississippi to the country. Over 1,000 brave volunteers, many of them young students, traveled to the Deep South to join local activists in a monumental effort. Their mission? To register African-American voters, establish freedom schools, and challenge the systemic racism that had gripped the region for decades. Freedom schools were more than just places of learning. They were beacons of hope. Here, children and adults alike received an education that was denied to them by an unjust, racist system. They learned about their rights, their history, and the power that they held within their community. The efforts of Freedom Summer culminated in the formation of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, which challenged the legitimacy of the all-white Mississippi delegation at the 1964 Democratic National Convention. The powerful testimony of Fannie Lou Hamer brought national attention to the struggles of Black Mississippians. All of this is on account of we want to register to become first class citizens. And if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep? with our telephones off of the hook because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live 
a decent human being in America. Thank you. But Freedom Summer was not without tragedy. The murder of Andrew Goodman, James Earl Cheney, and Michael Schwerner shocked the nation and highlighted the brutal reality of the fight for civil rights. Despite the horrific events that happened to many Freedom Summer volunteers and organizers, their efforts are widely recognized as the driving force behind the pressure placed on President Lyndon B. Johnson to eventually sign the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act in the following year. Today, the legacy of Freedom Summer lives on. Through our work at the Andrew Goodman Foundation, we mobilize young people to continue the legacy of Goodman, Cheney, and Schwerner on college campuses and in their surrounding communities across the country. We believe the movement of young people that propelled Freedom Summer did not end in 1964, but continues on today and will tomorrow through the spirit of young people who persistently fight for equitable voting rights. That was such an incredible video. Thank you so much, Mo. I'm now very excited to pass it over to Alexander Davis, who will introduce himself and then also our keynote speaker. Take it away, Alex. Good morning. Uh, thank you, Kaylee. Thank you, Mo. That was great. Uh, my name is Alexander Davis, and I serve as the Vice President of Development here at the Andrew Goodman Foundation. This year, as we gather virtually from across the country and prepare for our shared work ahead, we also commemorate the 60th anniversary of Freedom Summer. Our theme, 64 to 24, reminds us of the enduring spirit and dedication of those who fought for civil rights and voting rights six decades ago. Today, we will continue their legacy by empowering and celebrating a new generation of young leaders, activists, and change makers. To that end, I have the distinct privilege this morning of introducing our keynote speaker, Jalakoy Solomon. Jalakoy is an accomplished professional, a dedicated civic leader, and a dear friend of mine whom I had the fortune of meeting during our time in graduate school together at the George Washington University in DC. In the decades since we met, I've seen Jalakoy grow from her first roles as a volunteer field organizer in local elections to where she is today, leading major national campaigns and organizations. And throughout all of the different roles we've each held and the many changes in our lives, Jalakoy has been a trusted confidant and truth teller whenever I've needed her to be. There is no one working today to make our country finally live up to our values and our ideals that I respect more than Jalakoy. Jalakoy now serves as the Executive Vice President Campaigns and Partnerships at Civic Nation, where she has been a transformative force driving initiatives that inspire, educate, and mobilize citizens across the country. Her work has been instrumental in bringing broadband access to underserved rural communities nationwide. And during the height of COVID, Jalakoy led a national grassroots effort to ensure that communities of color hit hardest by the pandemic had access to vaccines and accurate, timely information. Jalakoy's leadership has changed and saved lives. Her journey from an aspiring graduate student to a national civic leader is both inspiring and honestly unsurprising to me. Jalakoy's commitment to social justice, her strategic vision, and her unwavering dedication to empowering communities have made her a catalyst for change. Today, Jalakoy will share some of her insights and experiences, providing us with a deeper understanding of what it means to do the work of building an equitable and participatory democracy. So with that, please join me in giving a warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Jalakoy Solomon. Perfect, thank you so much, Alex. Ugh, what a cry over here. Um, I love Alex so much. Um, so, so excited to be with, be with you all today. Um, so good morning, everyone. Um, you know, thank you to the Andrew Goodman Foundation for having me and to Alex for that wonderful introduction. It's really an honor to be here with so many passionate and dedicated individuals who are committed to making our to making a difference in our communities and in, in, in our country. As you know, we all know the political environment right now can feel really overwhelming with challenges that sometimes seem insurmountable. We face a landscape where voter suppression tactics are evolving, where misinformation spreads rapidly, and where the fight for equality and justice is an uphill battle. 
but it is precisely in these times that we must look to the past for inspiration and for wisdom, to the heroes who came before us and paved the way with their courage and resilience. As you know, it is the 60th anniversary of Freedom Summer 1964. As I began preparing for this keynote and diving deeper into the history of that moment in time and its parallels to today, two words kept coming to mind for me, courage and community. Uh, during that time in 1964, hundreds of brave young activists from all backgrounds, many of whom were students and young people just like you, traveled to Mississippi to register Black voters, teach in freedom schools, and challenge the entrenched systems of inequality. They worked across age, race, and gender to build a sense of community and shared purpose, and found ways, big and small, to celebrate wins and carve out moments of joy amidst hatred and violence. Among these courageous activists was Andrew Goodman, a young man whose commitment to justice led him to join these efforts in Mississippi. Alongside James Cheney and Michael Schwerner, Andrew tragically lost his life in the pursuit of freedom and civil rights at the hands of the KKK. Their legacy is a reminder of the high stakes of this work and the profound impact of individual action. The courage of these activists to confront this injustice head on, often at great personal risk, cannot be overstated. Their commitment and resilience ignited a spark that would fuel the larger civil rights movement, leading to transformative legislative victories like the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. As we celebrate these historic achievements and honor their lives and their work, we must do so with the understanding that the fight is far from over. The challenges faced by the activists of Freedom Summer are not relics of the past. Today, we confront new forms of voter suppression and disenfranchisement. Political violence is on the rise. Across the country, we've seen a wave of restrictive voting laws, including the closure of polling locations, the cancellation of vote by mail and drop box options, the introduction of stringent voter ID requirements, and according to recent reports, over 400 bills with provisions that restrict voting access have been introduced in 49 states in just the last few years. These modern tactics are a sobering reminder that our democracy is fragile and that the rights we hold dear must be vigorously protected. For instance, in Georgia, new laws have severely restricted the use of ballot drop boxes and added stringent ID requirements for absentee ballots, making it harder, harder for many, especially black and brown and low income voters to cast their ballots. Similarly in Texas, legislation has been enacted that limits early voting hours and empowers partisan poll, work, poll watchers, which can intimidate and disenfranchise voters. And some of our most vocal and powerful political leaders are doing everything they can to undermine faith in our electoral process and poison our democracy with hate. And despite these challenges, the legacy of Freedom Summer offers us a path forward. The organizers and volunteers of that era demonstrated that you don't have to be a Fannie Lou Hammer or Martin Luther King Jr. or another capital H history making person to make a lasting difference though I am so confident that many of you on this call will be. Each of us has a place in this work and with courage and community, we can build the world we wanna live in. I know this because I've seen it reflected in the work that I've done throughout my career. I've seen Miss Carla, a nurse in Louisiana who lost her husband to COVID-19 in 2020. Despite her grief, she began a mobile vaccine service to make sure that no one else would have to experience the heartbreak that she endured. Her courage to turn personal tragedy into a public service is a testament to the power of individual action. Carla's mobile vaccine service not only saved lives, but also restored hope in her community. Her story is a powerful reminder that even in the, the face of immense personal loss, we can find the strength to make a difference. And I've seen it in Miss Luna, a mother in Texas who became a digital equity champion in her community after her son got enrolled in the Affordable Connectivity Program. She organized a block party to share that knowledge with her network, ensuring that everyone had access to the internet and the opportunities that it brings. The impact of her work extends far beyond just providing internet access and empowered her community with the tools and resources to fully participate in the digital world, in our democracy, um, from you know, remote education to telehealth services and beyond. These stories highlight that change is possible and that it often begins with small localized efforts that ripple out to create broader impacts. 
The world of building, the work of building a fairer, more just society is not confined to grand gestures or monumental acts. It happens in everyday actions, in moments of courage and community that together build the foundation for larger movements. This work requires all of us, no matter how big or small the action. As President Obama said when he posthumously presented Andrew the Presidential Medal of Freedom in 2014, quote, I am one of the many who stand on the shoulders of giants like Andy. His death forever changed our nation, and in, and in his example, we are reminded of the difference we each can make when we summon the courage to lift up the lives of others. So as you head into your trainings um, later today, think about what role can I play? This is not just a rhetorical question, it is a call to action. Our democracy depends on your involvement, period. Whether it's volunteering to register voters, hosting informational sessions in your community, using your voice to advocate for policy changes, every action counts. Reflect on your unique skills and passions and consider how you can leverage them to contribute to the movement. Perhaps you have a talent for organizing events or a knack for communicating complex issues in a way that resonates with others. Whatever your strengths, there is a place for you in this work. And I'd love to just take a moment to hear more about the work that everyone on this call is already doing or that you are planning to do this year um, and into the future. And so I'd love if folks could, if we could take a minute, if folks could drop into the chat what you are planning to do this year to help make a difference. I'd love for you to share your ideas, your plans, your passions. Um, I hope we can inspire each other and build a network of support and action. Um, and as you are dropping in the chat, I'd love if you could also include the location that you're uh, zooming in from so that we can find folks near us who are planning really cool work. Um, so we'll just take a minute and I'd love to see some um, folks drop into the chat the work that they are doing this year. Yes, we have to make sure everyone has a plan to vote. Uh, yes, being a, being a poll worker, so, so critical. Um, as you know, as we've seen, there are um, forces out there that are trying to make voting intimidating um, and keep people from the polls. And so we need well-trained, smart, democracy-minded poll workers um, to be the vanguards of our democracy. Yes, we love voting voting efforts on campus. I um, you know, didn't include in here. I was I, I was a state director for Next Gen America in Arizona, um, and so did a lot of work on campus and working with young folks and students. Um, and it's just such amazing work to do work um to, to work with young people to understand that, you know, as we all, you know, we say young people are our future, but ensuring that we are building habits for democracy and for civic engagement young um, and helping to ensure that that young people's voices are included in our process. So I love that. Yes, recruiting poll workers, celebrating civic holidays, voter, yes, voter registrations. Oh, Arlington. Yes, I'm here. Well, today, actually, I'm in Baltimore for a census conference, but um, I normally am in Arlington. Yes, door knocking. So good. I love this. Uh, thank you. Well, please keep dropping what you are working on in the chat. I wanna make sure we can save this chat and share out amazing things that um, that you all are doing in your communities. And so thank you for sharing um, that amazing work that you are doing to make our country a better place. Your dedication and enthusiasm are an inspiration. And as we know together, we are stronger and we can really build the world that we want to live in. Um, so again, remember that everyone has a place in this work. If you don't see it, you can build it. You can create the space that you want to see. Um, and so I want folks to reflect on what motivates you, what drives you, what role that you can play in this movement. Your why is your fuel. It will carry you through the challenges and the victories ahead. It is the reason you wake up every morning ready to fight for a better world. And it's what sustains you when the road gets tough. Um, so I just want to thank you for being here, for your dedication, for your commitment to building a more fair, caring, and just world um, with courage in the face of adversity, rooted in deep community. Together, we can create lasting change. 
Um, so let us continue to honor the legacy of Freedom Summer by striving every day to make our democracy more inclusive, equitable, and just for all. Thank you all so much for having me. Thank you so much, Shalakoy. That was lovely. I believe we have a time for question and answer now. So we have some questions prepared for you and we encourage all of our attendees to submit questions in the chat or come off mute, raise your hand, um, and we will hear more from you. So my first question is... Reflecting on the courage demonstrated by the activists during Freedom Summer 1964, what advice would you give to students today who may feel discouraged by the current political climate? Yes, that, um, that things only change when we do the work. You know, that, um, what, what is the quote that you, you know, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take. You know, it is that we, we, were, we are, are destined to fail if we can, if we sit in um, a sense of despair, a sense of darkness, of not coming together and doing the work that needs to be done to build the world that we want, and so I think you know the the forces that are against us want us to be despondent. They want us not to take the fight to them. They want us to be resigned to the world they want us to live in, and we can reject that. We can choose to reject that. And we can decide that we are going to come together and build the world that we want to live in. And so, again, I want each of us to think about what what skills do we specifically have that we can bring to this movement um, and build together so that we can, again, build the world that we want to live in. And I know that we can do it. Thank you so oh, much. I think yes, I see Caroline's question in the chat. Um, you know, to repeat back, we know that sometimes these fights take a long time um, before, uh, and, and some losses before there are wins. Um, so when I talk about a time that one of my campaigns didn't go as planned or wasn't su wasn't successful at first, um, I think, and this may be, you know, again, a somewhat smaller example, but I, I'm actually currently going through this. I'm currently running a student deck forgiveness campaign. Um, and as we all know, we still got debt out here. And so we continue and we continue to see, um, again, forces who are against building a world where everyone not just, you know, is able to get by, but is able to thrive, continue to push back on these efforts to support, you know, to provide the relief and support that Americans deserve. Um, and so, you know, I'm working on this campaign to help folks lower their monthly payments that they currently owe to find and connect to paths for forgiveness. Um, and we, about six weeks ago, got some court rulings that um, paused our um, ability to support folks in accessing forgiveness. Um, you know, the Department of Education is doing, you know, good work in the courts to push back against that. We were in a place where we could continue enrolling folks and continue providing support and relief. And then another court just last week struck down our ability to do this work. Um, and so we're we just every week, it feels like we're pivoting in the work that we need to do and trying to always keep in mind the the end user. So the thing that I say regularly to my team is that, you know, we are here to serve in at least in this specific campaign, the borrower, the borrower who has been paying for 20 years and owes more than they originally borrowed and just can't get out under this debt. We are here to to serve them. And so whatever we need to change about our however we need to pivot, however, whatever we need to change about our programming so that we can ensure that that borrower has the best version of um, customer service and support that they can get so that we can help them. We That is what we're here to do. Um, so I think, again, just keeping your eye on the prize, ensuring that you are thinking about like what is the outcome you're trying to, to have, who is who are you trying to serve, um, and keeping your, keeping your eye on them. Yes, thank you, Rashawn. So, um, sharing out some ways, some important things that folks can think about um, and do to stay active, even in quote unquote off years. So um, Rashawn, you know that there are there are no off years. We are always doing this work. This work is year round. It is cycle cycle round. Um, and we I, I think something that I I think another very great example of this is um, as you know, 
I, I, I work at Civic Nation. We are a 501c3. Um, so we are not, we don't take positions on different elections, but I think a thing that we, we have seen in the last 10 days, uh, you know, 14 days, um, is a, a wave of enthusiasm in um, politics. And something that I, I'm sure you all saw that there was a, you know, a Black women for Kamala call that had happened that Sunday that we learned that she, you know, was was taking over the ticket um, and that had 44,000, you know, Black women join that call. That's because um, the House is... Um... Oh, wait. Yeah. Oh, and um, we... Something that I, I saw folks say about that moment, there were a lot of folks that were like, oh, they, you know, they galvanized quickly and they were, they were able to just you know, get everyone together so fast. And they actually replied back to say, actually, we've been having a regular convening of Black women every Sunday for four years now. They said, you, you know, you don't have to, you know, get ready if you stay ready. And so they were ready to, to absorb that energy. They were ready to mobilize and continue to activate and, and take this moment and run with it because, they were organizing every day, every year, you know, every every week, every month, every year, um, no kind of no off years to stay ready. And so I think that is such a great and powerful example of ensuring that you are finding the the local, you know, either you're building the club on campus or you're finding the place where you can plug in on campus and your community um, to stay engaging regularly. There are, you know, there are of course these large national fights, but there are there is work happening every single day in your community, whether that's getting the stop sign, you know, a, a across the street so that there are not, um, you know, you know, accidents, whether that's, you know, your roads, your schools. So make, making sure that you are finding your your place um, that you feel passionate about that aligns with your why and that you can plug into locally in your community because there is always work to do. Great. I see Alex's question for students that are thinking about graduation and their next steps. Um, what advice do you have for folks as they navigate those next steps in their career? Um, if you're choosing to go into, you know, civic engagement work full time, um, and how do you think about what to do next? So for me, I actually wasn't fully plugged into this work until, um, I, I don't know if I would say like later in life, but, you know, after I graduated college, I actually didn't know much about civic engagement work and politics, you know, going through um, high school and college. Um, both of my parents are in the Air Force and they were very much a, like, you know, whoever is the president is my commander in chief and we don't talk about politics and we don't, choose, you know, we, we just don't get into it. And so it was just never really a, a thing in my household. And so for me, it was something I came to, you know, a little after, you know, after school um, and, I guess maybe took a somewhat more non-traditional path to get into this work. Um, and so something I've been able to see though throughout my time is that, um, you know, it is, it, it can, it, while it can be sometimes maybe hard to get into this work, I've, I've seen it be also like extremely easy. If you are, if you are clear about your, what you're passionate about, you're clear about, um, the kind of work that you want to do to get out there and find folks who are um, in this movement with you um, and to find ways to volunteer and then to get you know full-time employment and to to step into this work. I think I've I have seen my trajectory be one that um, you know as long as you are you are leaning in and you are doing the work and you are you know building those relationships that this is absolutely a, a place where you can build a career and you can that that is part of why I love doing this work because I get to every day wake up and do work that is helping people that is trying to build a, a better world and so I think as you're you're thinking about what to do I would recommend um doing like informational interviews, connecting with folks who are doing the kind of work that you are interested in and that you want to do. Um, I will offer myself up if folks would love, would like to, you know, get coffee and have a chat, happy to connect um, and kind of talk through what, what is interesting to you and what you want to do um, and think about um, what types of organizations exist, what type of roles exist. Um, I think there are just there's a plethora of opportunities, and I felt like I I didn't actually know about all those things when I was coming out of school. Um, but 
now see like such a wide variety of things that folks can do to really be, um, you know, you know, adding their voice to this movement and their their power to this movement. Yeah, um, I'm seeing um, Heaven's question about what would I consider to be a highlight or an unexpected benefit of my civic work so far. Um, I think I will still go back to the student loan work. Um, and, you know, again, it's I'm really rooted in it right now, but just being able to see how impactful you know, this work has been like, I, I even like cry. I'm like, it just, I'm a crier. So I'm gonna try my best. Um, but it's just, it like, you know, we, we did the first, we decided to pilot this version of in-person clinics. Um, so we're working, you know, in partnership with the Department of Education. They've come in and they've trained my team on the, you know, the kind of student loan landscape and the different programs folks can enroll in and their eligibility and requirements. Um, and we decided to, to pilot some in-person events where, you know, we would come and, you know, open up your laptop, log into your account, walk you through the different types of loans you have, what programs you could be eligible for, um, help you reduce your payments. And genuinely, the first, like, after the first event, we knew we would continue to do these because we had, you know, 30, you know, you know, older black folks who joined us. And so we've seen an overwhelming you know, number of black folks attend these clinics, um, older folks who have been in repayment for so long and just did not know what to do. They felt underwater. Um, and we have been able so far to help folks see forgiveness of over $5 million across our student loan clinics. Um, We've been able, there's a, it is currently on pause, but there's a program that allows borrowers to potentially reduce their monthly payments down to zero dollars a month. Um, we've been able to help, you know, hundreds of folks enroll in that program and just seeing the the relief, the joy we've had, the, you know, this is one of the the most, it has felt one of the most powerful programs I've been able to to help lead and 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 do just for the like in the individual impact that it's having one person at a time um, to give them, you know, peace of mind and, and um, you know, just empower them with, with the information that they needed to make those, make, to, to engage with those programs. So um, that's something I feel, I've been feeling very um, excited about and definitely, as I said, cried on three occasions in these clinics. Um, and so it's so, so good. Yeah, so I think Mia, some similar question. I I think that that is very much giving me hope, but also, um, you know, again the the last few weeks um, and all of these, just like the momentum, the calls, the joy. I have, you know, I am I as I am a black woman. I am a queer woman, and the last few months have felt really hard, and this moment gives me a lot of hope. Yes, Roland, about, you know, not feeling demoralized, I think, and avoiding burnout. I will be honest, this is something that I also need support with because it, again, it has been, um, I, I think, well, I think actually this moment gives us some, um, some examples of that. It is finding those places where there are wins, however, you know, big or small, um, that can continue to fuel you. I think, you know, again, I had been feeling this sense of some burnout and some, you know, just like, just feel sit in the sitting in where the moment we were in, um, and we this, you know, the the swing I think folks are, have been feeling over the last few weeks um, is such a, a drastic example of it. But I think we can find that as in, as a illustrative in even smaller moments of if you're starting to feel you know really demoralized and burnt out and like the work you're doing is is not making an impact i think it's really sitting back reflecting on your on your work but also the the larger space and finding those small the small wins and also carving out for yourself 
um, smaller paths forward. So, you know, I think I, I will admit I used to be this person that was just very like, you know, I'm working on these, you know, I'm working on these campaigns, I'm doing this really big work, I'm taking it all on my shoulders. Um, and one person alone can't do it all. We can't do it all by ourselves. We are working within a larger ecosystem. And so even though your work may, it, for any of us, may feel like it's stalling, may feel like we're we're hitting a wall, there's someone else out there in the movement in some other community who is winning. And how do we find them? How do we learn from them? How do we lift them up um, and build that network we need so that we can all continue to rise together? So I think that this moment has helped reinvigorate me and reminded me that um, we gotta we, we we can find find our wins and come together, um, and so, yes, I I found this this time to be really, really galvanizing. Thank you so much. I think we have one last question in the yeah. chat from Barbara, and then we will transition out of our Q and A. Yes, let me see. Yes, um, this is another really great question and a tough question. Um, I think, you know, again, I think in all of our work, it is about, um, it's about connection. I think we, we, we created on our vaccine campaign um, a kind of, um, not necessarily a script, but a framework for how we talk to folks about the vaccine, um, because we were hitting, especially in communities of color, a lot of resistance to the vaccine, to the, you know, to something coming from the government, a lot of mistrust about, you know, the vaccines, um, you know, being created so quickly and, um, you know, how, you know, is this really what's best for our communities? Um, and so we, we kind of, did a lot of research and thought about what is the best way to talk to someone um, who is going to be initially resistant to what you are are trying to you know advocate for, um, and you know again it, it, it may seem like common sense, but comes really comes down to just like building, um, building like a share like a shared understanding and really building that um, you know that that connection and relationship and really building that trust with someone and so. Um, we called it like the the Teo method. So it's kind of like, you know, building trust, um, building, you know, connecting on empathy and helping someone find their their own reason. And so, you know, thinking about starting from a place of shared shared values. And sometimes that might mean asking a lot of questions on un really understanding, you know, what they what is important to them and what they um, and how they see the world. Um, and then helping them, you know, empathizing with them. I think in, especially to the specific example you have provided, uh, it should, you know, hopefully it is not hard to find that empathy and to understand where um, that person is coming from in a really real sense. Um, and then, you know, trying to move them along to finding their, their reason, their own reason for um, being civically engaged. Um, and so, you know, telling them stories like those of the Freedom Summer and the work that, you know, our ancestors have done to get us to this moment where we need to um, leverage all the tools in our toolbox to understand that voting is just one tool in our toolbox. And it is an extremely critical one to ensure that we have an environment that we can work within to continue to leverage all the other tools to get free, to build the world that we want to build. And so I think, you know, it, it, it will take, it is not just like a one sentence, you know, like it is, it takes time, it takes work, it takes really engaging with folks to understand um, and to, you know, build again a shared with, build with them a shared understanding of the, the, the current democracy that we have and the current world that we are working within so that we can, um, again, leverage all the different tools we have to, to get to the end result we're trying to get to. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. And as I mentioned in the chat, we have so many sessions today that will continue to answer all of your questions. Thank you so much, Jalakoy, for sharing your experience. That was so valuable. And we are so grateful for you.